The following is a production of Jefferson Pilot Sports. It's not where you start in Pocono that matters. St. Amant is good when it matters in Missouri. Ron's the fellow in Trans Am. And we've got a roof job any contractor would be proud of. Hold your breath, it's time for Final Edition. And hi everybody, I'm Pat Patterson. Sit back for the next hour. We've got uh, all of your favorite sport you can stand. We'll start with the NASCAR, where the big story happened before the teams ever took to the track. Veteran crew chief Buddy Parrott has left the Diamond Ridge racing team. You'll recall NASCAR's uh, winningest crew chief over the last two seasons left Rusty Wallace at the end of last year to own part of the Diamond Ridge team and call the shots. Driver Steve Grissom benefited from Parrott's experience with a strong start to the season, but hasn't been so strong lately. No reason was given for Parrott's departure in the team's prepared statement, and Parrott was unavailable for comment. Now to Sunday's UAW GM Teamwork 500. Last year, both pole winners won the race, but Kenny Schrader had to be feeling a little bit confident going into this one. After all, Kyle Petty broke a long winless streak the week before, and these, th these things tend to run in cycles. Stephanie Boyd has our story. Daryl Waltrip is ready to go the distance after taking relief a few races from rib injuries. Unfortunately, his engine has other ideas that's only lap two. A couple of circuits later, Sterling Marlin gets into Dale Jarrett to put him behind the wall for 72 laps. And Jarrett uses the downtime to exchange cake recipes with the Kodak crew. Hey, it could happen. $10,000 awaits the mid-race leader, and that's Jeff Gordon, who then pits and is still in front when he comes back out. Kyle Petty's bid for two in a row is obviously over before the two-thirds mark. Dark Horse candidate Hutch Strickland is turning a lot of heads in a lame duck ride and swaps the point with Gordon for 20 laps or so. After his brother's mechanical trouble causes a caution later on, Ward Burton goes for this slide with a leader right behind him. Everybody gets through somehow and another caution waves. Defending race champ Rusty Wallace is never in this one as he's got a handful of his Miller Ford. Wallace will finish. After having the hot car all afternoon, on the final restart, Gordon misses a shift, and that sours his engine. With the dominant car now limping along, teammate Terry Labonte takes over and pulls off an historic first at Pocono. He triumphs from 27th, the worst starting position for a winner in event history. Ted Musgrave gets second with the pole sitter third. Marlon and Strickland complete the top five. For On Pit Road Final Edition, I'm Stephanie Boyd. Steph, we'll take a look at the points. Dale Earnhardt was uh, never a factor in this one. Jeff Gordon's miscue cost him pretty dramatically. Uh, Labonte moves up. The uh, cars of Sterling Marlin, or excuse me, the cars of uh, Jack Roush's finished fourth and fifth. Stand by. We'll have a lot more of Final Edition when we come back. Hang around. We're just getting started. Well, in all my days of doing it, folks, I have never seen the entire lights go out in a studio. But guess what? They did. Now, you stay around. Don't worry. I may look a little fuzzy here, but we'll get you the highlights just like we always do. Big news from Formula One. Neither Michael Schumacher nor Damon Hill uh, was a big winner in Montreal. Instead, it was John Lacey pulling off his first ever career victory. Schumacher was forced out of the pit late with electrical trouble, but he still rallied to fifth. Uh, Barrichello and Irvine both posted their best finishes this year. Now, uh, coming up uh, we, next, we've got all sorts of stock car racing for you, and uh, we'll have a sprinkling of IndyCar thrown in, so you stick around. We'll have more in just a minute. All right. As you can tell, we're, uh, we're doing live TV here, so let's go on now to uh, IndyCar. Robbie Gordon uh, crashed twice on qualifying, or trying to qualify for today's IndyCar stop in Detroit. Uh, Walker Racing driver still went out and won uh, the race. He led the last uh, first eight laps and uh, for 24 of the remaining laps to win his, his second race of the year. Jimmy Vassar was the only uh, other uh, driver. He finished third, a second behind uh, on the Bell Island course. Pruitt and Andretti. Uh, and Unser were next in the top five. In the points, uh, Jacques Villeneuve is up by four over Gordon with Pruitt third, Unser fourth, and Andretti fifth. And in case you're wondering again, we're trying to uh, sort out our electrical problems here. We'll try to get it done for you. Uh, one other, other IndyCar note, Scott Goodyear, who uh, jumped the restart for the Indianapolis 500, 
uh, has signed on for another two races with the Tasman Motorsports team. Uh, he ran at the Brickyard, and he'll run at Mid-Ohio and at Vancouver. Now, more stock cars. I knew I was going to get to this part. Bush Grand National Series rarely runs a short track race on a Saturday afternoon, but when it's Myrtle Beach uh, earlier in the afternoon, it gives everybody a chance to go to the beach when it's all over with. Let's take a look at what happened. Jeff Green has his first series pole, but no one this season has won from that spot. He'll pace the opening laps. The hard work is being done further back in the field, where Chad Little, who started a dismal 29th, is making a strong move forward. The Harris Teeter Ford driver had only raced this track once before, but he quickly gets the handle on the half mile. He'll soon be into the top 20, despite running on only seven cylinders. Series champ David Green's tough season continues as his slim Jim Chevy is the first car out with engine failure. Approaching halfway, Jason Keller is in the lead and does well to get by a spinning Tracy Leslie without harm. The restart kills Little. A tap sends him into the inside wall and he'll need 46 laps behind the wall before returning. Nearing lap 200, Green gets the measure of Keller who's losing the handle. The action stays good up front for 20 laps as Doug Hebron catches Green and takes the point in some good, clean racing. But for the second week in a row, the number 35 suffers mechanical failure. That puts Larry Pearson in the lead, and he essentially cruises over the final 50 laps to his second win of the year. Keller takes a career-best second. Setzer scores a season-best third. Green is fourth, and Bobby Dodder fifth. Johnny Benson gets a ninth, while Little is 32nd, so the margin in the points battle is back up a bit. It's 148 points now. Pearson's win moves him back into fifth. This is Mark Allen reporting for On Pit Road Final Edition. Thanks, Mark. I went outside. I looked up. Yes, yes, yes. It is a full moon tonight. Uh, the ASA AC Delco Challenge Series uh, had a night show in Missouri, and the series points leader didn't have his best race of the year. Bob Seneker's on the pole for the second straight week as the tour settles in to run one of its longest races of the year. Just moments in, Tony Roper and Jay Sauter become the first spectators of the evening. And it's a wonder the freight train behind doesn't end up in similar condition. Rick Beebe does get a cut tire out of the deal. Points leader Eddie is clearly out to lunch, and the culprit is his tires. The good wrench driver isn't sure which one, and when he pits, a pair of rears are the answer. But the green flag stop costs him two laps he won't make up. Through the middle laps, Jennerstown winner Seneker is setting the pace. Bill Baird is doing very well in second, but this drift up the banking is a symptom of bigger problems. Within half a lap, the 26 goes for a ride, as do his hopes for a top five. At least he takes a car home. That's more than Dave Sensabaugh does after almost heading off into the night. These cautions have got the leaders pitting periodically, and in the closing circuits, Gary St. Amant in the seven is on the point. He's getting a lot of pressure from Glenn Allen Jr. that lasts most of the final 40 laps. But in the end, the seven car has just enough to give St. Amant his first win of the season. Well, he's a little bit off on our setup in the beginning, and we ended up making uh, probably two or three pit stops more than what anybody else made. And that made all the difference. The crew done a hell of a job getting the car right, and uh, whew, boy, Glenn was pushing me there at the end. <laughs> Brad Loney takes third with Joe Knott and Seneker fourth and fifth. Guys, I know I got at least one more flashlight in the truck. Now, don't worry. You don't have to be in the dark. We'll just kind of finagle our way through it. We got lots of highlights, lots of sprint cars coming your way. We'll be right back, I hope. Just been one of them strange kind of days. Yes, it has. Welcome back. For all you World of Outlaws fans who wondered if Steve Kinzer had lost anything during his brief detour through the uh, Winston uh, Cup Series, we thought you'd uh, find this interesting. Kinzer has won four of 14 races since early May, which is almost the same percentage as in recent years. He's got another shot at a win last night at Eldora Speedway. Meanwhile, the Knoxville Raceway had a Legends race. Fresh off their New York swing, the World of Outlaws are back at Eldora Speedway on Saturday night, complete with their traditional four-wide salute to the fans. 
But once the action turns green, club all-star regular Dale Blaney puts tradition to rest as he gets the jump on pole sitter Andy Hillenburg to take the early lead. Next, Hillenburg is challenged by Mark Kenzer in the number five. He gets past the STP driver to take second, heading into turn three. But one lap later in the exact same spot, Hillenburg returns the favor and retakes the runner-up spot. That leaves Kenzer to try and hold off his cousin for third, because you knew the king would be along sooner or later. But Steve won't have an easy job of it as Sammy Swindell in the number one Hooters machine enters the picture. They play a little game of crisscross, but Stevie K eventually gets the spot and takes the low line to get past MK. A couple of laps later, Swindell slows on the front stretch with a bum motor. Then just after the restart, Kenzer gets past Hillenburg for second. Now for the first 13 laps, it's been all Blaney up front. But Kenzer has other ideas, and even a lapped car sandwich can't keep him from taking over the point. While running up front, the 11 touches wheels with Joe Gertie in the 77 machine, and Gertie goes slamming head-on into the wall and flips. Blaney clips him, and Jack Hoddenshield in the 22 tries to slow, but the Pinsoil driver has nowhere to go and slides into the wreckage, while Dave Blaney barely misses them just behind. Hoddenshield gets the worst of it as an ankle injury sends him to a local hospital where he's treated and released. Once all the wreckage is cleared, both Blaney's are at the back of the field for the restart. Dale does a tremendous job working his way back up through the field, but he can't get within the top five before time runs out, and Kinzer easily goes on to pay another visit to Victory Lane. Behind him, it's Hillenburg, Jeff Swindell, Mark Kinzer, and Stevie Smith. Meanwhile, at the capital of the sprint car world, the folks at Knoxville Raceway start their weekly show by honoring the latest inductees into the Sprint Car Hall of Fame. One of those is Rick Ferkel, who then goes on to defend his title in the Pennzoil Masters Classic for drivers 50 and above. Number 57, Mike Brooks, leads the first two laps until Ferkel comes along to take over on lap three. And from there on out, the race is all his as Ferkel tops off a glorious day with a victory. In the feature attraction starring the 410 Sprints, number 81 Jerry Richard gets by Terry McCarl in the 24 for the early lead. Then the turning point comes when Kevin Doty in the number 7 brings out the yellow flag. On the restart, it's a three-way battle for the lead between Richard McCarl and Johnny Herrera, who has entered the fray. And it's McCarl who outpowers the others for the top spot, which he never relinquishes the rest of the way for his 11th career win at Knoxville. Second goes to Skip Jackson, followed by Herrera, Craig Delansky, and Steve Beitler, who beat Richard out of the top five. What if that light thing ever happened to Geraldo? We, we finally got him back. I'm happy and hope you are. A wicked crash figured into uh, last weekend's SCRA race in California, as Jason Young has the story. The way the evening starts for Ron Schumann, you would think that the SCRA points leader is poised to have a great evening. He starts by setting a track record in time trials on the Bakersfield Speedway third mile. He ends it in the passing master's dash with a nasty flip that knocked him out literally. Shu spends the night in the hospital with a concussion, and the violence of the impact is best shown in the broken roll cage. In the 30-lap feature, J.J. Yaley is the pole sitter and early leader in search of his first win of the year. But when he comes up to lap Jim Giardina, he goes from first to fourth just that quick. Steve Osling takes the point. Just before mid-race, this parking lot in turn one interrupts the action, but nobody got airborne. Corey Cruzman is second as he has to use all his talents to save it, but he'll give up second to Leland McSpadden. On lap 22, the lead almost changes hands as the Tempe Tornado gets ahead before the cushion gets in the way. Then with two laps to go, McSpadden makes the same move but with different results and holds on for the win. Yaley ends up third with Cruzman fourth and Mike English fifth. The Schumann crash drops him to second in the points behind Rip Williams. McSpadden, despite his four wins, is third with Corey and Mike Kirby fourth and fifth. For On Pit Road Final Edition, I'm Jason Young reporting. Thanks, J-Man. Uh, Ronnie said uh, that he will be fine. He did have a concussion, but he was home by Sunday afternoon and told us earlier today that uh, he could have raced uh, this weekend if there was an SCRA race. The series is back in action next weekend. Now, coming up, an all-pro race where local knowledge was a big advantage. It's on Pit Road Final Edition. Shed some light. We'll be right back.
On Pit Road Final Edition is brought to you by your GM Goodwrench service dealer. We want your business. And by AC Delco. It's like buying time. Welcome back to the big show, everybody. This is the NASCAR segment of the show where we give you all the details of the other touring series. Two of them ran in the southeast, and we'll look at the action from the Slim Jim All Pro Tour where drivers could not relax even under caution. Shane Hall leads the first lap of the Lanier 250, but by lap two, outside pole sitter Wayne Willard in the 0-1 gets by to take the point. Willard is the local favorite, and his dominating run is proof positive that he knows his way around this 3 8 mile oval. When number 24 Brad Correll gets in the leader's way, Willard simply nudges him out, and to Correll's credit, he keeps it going. Then when second place Hall gets caught behind the 24 car, he too knocks Correll out of the way and tries to make up the lost ground on Willard. Further back in the field, there are a lot of great battles for position and there are plenty of spins to shake up the mix. But the strangest one happens in the first half of the race when Mike Koch gets into the back of number two, Steve Allison. Allison spins while Cope and Jody Ridley in the 98 keep going. But under the caution, somehow Cope and Ridley are taken out, and Allison happens to be there, too. Merely a coincidence? You make the call. In the second half of the race, it's still Willard up front, but when he heads to the pits under caution around lap 174, Hall is there to pick up the spot. Behind him, Toby Porter in the 80, and number 16, Hal Goodson, battle for second, with Goodson eventually getting the advantage. While he tries to close the gap on the leader, behind them, Willard is back on the move. Before long, he's in the top three. Then with less than 50 laps to go, he retakes the lead and starts pulling away. That leaves the rest of the top five to battle it out for position because Willard is just too hooked up and goes on to claim his first All-Pro Series win in dominating fashion. If I had to win one, I'd rather win it at home. And the, the Monte Carlo really worked great. Kane Electric, um, Automotive Specialties, Pat Chauncey, all these guys work good. Penske Shocks, Babylon. If it wasn't for these guys, we wouldn't be here. The crew got me in and out of the pits in a hurry, and that's what we needed. And that, and that told the tale. And, um, we got back out there in a hurry and had a good set of tires at the end. And, you know, but really, I didn't think nobody had nothing for us, and we had a good run. Wayne, you've won over 40 feature races here at Lanier, but this has got to count as about as big a victory as you've ever had here on your home turf. Yeah, I'm, the first win is always real big. And now I've got a, another first win in the All Pro Series. And Slim Jim's been great, and all the fellas here, all the officials, and um, it's great. I, I just don't know what to say. Goodson winds up second, and Billy Bigley gets past Hall for third. Toby Porter rounds out the top five. Meanwhile, the Goodies Dash Series took two weeks to complete 125 laps. Let's see, that's an average speed of about uh, 10 miles a day. Nah, just kidding, the subcompact division got part of the race in at Caraway Speedway in Ashboro two weeks ago before being postponed by rain. And rather than start from scratch, they finished the race Saturday night. For the first time at Caraway Speedway back in May, Robert Huffman has the field covered right from the start. Ernest Winslow and Danny Bagwell do not, and trigger in early yellow. Then the rains come on lap 43, and that means a return last Saturday night for the remaining laps. 17 of the original 28 starters returned, and what may have been missing in numbers is easily compensated for in action. On lap 57, Destry Gardner works his way into the lead and might have gotten a challenge from Larry Cottle, but in turn two, he'll go around. And how would you like to be Gary Moore or our cameraman for that matter? Moore is fine and the race is red flag. Here's a classic example of fluid on the track and Huffman is one of the victims in the late going. And how about a classic example of cool? Because that's what 17-year-old David Hutto is getting the lead late and holding on for his first career victory. Another teenager, Lyndon Amick, is second with Cotto rallying into the top five. Cotto still leads the points. And in the Southwest Tour race last night, the win went to Lance Hooper, who won by just one second over Sean Monroe. Points leader Jim Engelbright finished fourth. Engelbright leads Craig Roudman by 44 points. And in the AMA Superbike this afternoon, up in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, Miguel Duhamel wins it, uh, makes it two in a row. The Honda Mounted Rider squeezed out the narrowest of victories this afternoon over Mike Hale, the series points leader. 
The margin was one tenth of a second, and that's pretty impressive. Uh, pretty impressive top five at Road America. Coming up next, the Trans Am tilt from the Motor City, and we'll be joined by the series points leader, uh, by a series points leader, I should say. We'll tell you who that is and what series it is uh, right after this. But as we head to break, we're going to show you the address where you can send your comments, suggestions about our show, or maybe you'd just like to contribute to our light bill this month. I don't know, something like that. Hang around. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. All of the races on the SCCA Trans Am Tour, the most important, is Detroit. Why? Well, it's the home of the manufacturers, and they've always got a large contingent of corporate uh, people there. Saturday's race was seen on Prime Network and was a decent show for most and a fine show for one driver, as we see in this week's Rain-X Trans Am Report. Street courses are never easy to pass on, and the Belle Isle layout is no different. The Fast Five qualifying inversion puts Brian Till on the pole, but front row teammate Greg Pickett immediately takes the point. Pickett has chosen to go on the softer of two tire compounds available, so that means he'll be quick early and when the tires are cool, and not so good if there's a long stretch of green. With the concrete lurking so close, numerous cautions are a good bet. In fact, there is no caution at all for the first half of the race. Well, that doesn't mean that there hasn't been some contact, as number three qualifier Price Cobb proves on his Chevy. Pickett's strategy seems to be right on target, but he can't see very far in front, and that proves nearly disastrous. Tony Avi is sitting in the blind spot, and the leader proves he can hit a moving target. Surprisingly little damage to Pickett, but Avi is through. Till fades, leaving Ron Fellows on the leader's bumper, and they spend nearly 20 laps in a high-speed chess game. The number three car is on the harder tire, but it's going to take a mistake by the Rain-X driver for Fellows to get by. Turns out Pickett knew his tires were about shot, and he lets Fellows by with nine laps to go. While they're being polite up front, Tim McAdam hammers the wall, putting a third Rocket Sports car in the sideline, joining owner Paul Genalosi and Cobb. That sets up a one-lap shootout, but Fellows is stout enough, while Pickett does a fine job of keeping a hounding Dorsey Schrader in third. As Fellows wins, the fun isn't over if you call Rob Rizzo's post-checkers impact fun. So Fellows gets AER Racing's first win of the year, which is a nice comeback after that hard lick he took at Lime Rock Memorial Day. I gotta thank all the guys, you know. They, after that big hit, they got the car all fixed up. It was ready to go before I was. Uh, the car was perfect. I gotta thank Will and all the guys, Buzz McCall, everybody from Chevrolet. I mean, I just, I wanted to win this so bad. I mean, right from the start of the season, but I'm sore. <laughs> Fast qualifier Tom Kendall is fourth, and Rizzo fifth. He got the rising star of the race despite that shunt. And joining us here in the studio live, as if you haven't been with us for the uh, lights out section. Did you hit that switch over there? Lazaro, I didn't. Were you the guy? I didn't trip over. Anthony Lazaro <laughs> is here, and Anthony, of course, is the points leader in the uh, Hooters uh, Formula Series, uh, the, the Open Wheel Series. And, uh, well, you know, there's a hundred grand up for grabs here to the guy that can hold on to that points lead all year long, but you got 13 more races to go. I know we've had a little break right now. Our last race was at Lanier, and uh, our next one's going to be next week, June 17th. But I've enjoyed the little break we've had. I, I guess a lot of the guys have been out testing. I know we have a little bit. And, uh, you know, thanks to a great team, Team Atlanta and Jack Aru and BG, I think we're ready for the next 13 races to try to hold yeah. the points lead. It's, uh, it, it's been an interesting uh, series. Of course, we watched the development of it last year, and I talked with you many times, as I did mm -hmm. some other guys, about... You know, how difficult would it be for, a, for an F2000 car, Formula 2000 car, to run on short track ovals? And I think we all kind of wondered if, if, if the series would make it, but it really has. And the interest level, plus the money that's been paid there, has, has brought a lot of good drivers to the series. Oh, it certainly has. With Hooters' involvement, you know, putting up the $100,000 they have this year, it's 10000 for a win. It's just been incredible. And, uh, you know, guys like me, we've been dreaming of a series like this for a long time to where we can actually go and earn a living racing cars, and that's what I'm doing this year. And it's just been fantastic. You've, uh, you've had a pretty big following of folks that's been watching your efforts over the last couple of years. I know that, you know, down at uh, uh, the 24 Hours of, of Daytona, you were racing a car down there. You're doing this full series here. And certainly open wheel and, and moving up is something that I know you want to do. Is there a plan for Anthony Lazaro right now, or is this more or less just taking it one step and one race at a time? 
definitely going to concentrate on this year and this series because uh, winning the championship this year is the most important thing. But also at the same time, I'm keeping my eyes open for, for other opportunities, uh, Indy Lights possibly, but mainly stock car racing. That's where I'd really like to go. And Hooters has a good all-pro or an all-pro type stock car sure. series, late model series. and. Uh, that's something I'd like to get into. Well, Bush Grand that, National. That's interesting because I would think after the success you've had with the open wheel cars that uh, that really moving towards uh, the Indianapolis style type cars would be would be where you want to go. Why stock cars? What interests you about that? Mainly uh, the competition and the money involved. I mean, there's a lot of good series to run. There's a lot of good drivers in it right now, and it seems to be a place where it's uh, a good place for sponsors to be. And BG Products and Jack Roo, I think those are two two products that we could uh, carry in the next year. Yeah, well, certainly Hooters is, uh, has taken a real active role in, in all, both the late model series and the, and the open wheel series. Um, you guys race where next? Where's your next event? Linear next well, Saturday night, June 17th. And, and that really is your home turf. I mean, winning there <laughs> between you and, and Barfield and a few of the other guys that really spend a lot of time, that's, that's where you can do a lot of your testing, right? Yeah, that's our home track, and it's only about 30 minutes from Team Atlanta shop. And, also next weekend, I think Ernest Sykes is going to make a comeback. And you know what right. happened at the uh, second linear race last year with him. Yeah, he involved. won it. <laughs> so sure it'll enough. be tough. It's great to see you, man. Hey, good, glad good you're to be here. here. Thank glad you. Glad you're here. I'm glad somebody was here. Glad to the lights are on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll try to keep the lights on the rest of the show. But uh, good luck next weekend. Hope Thank it goes you. Well. Anthony Lazaro, hey, you stick around. We're going to get uh, all wet and submerge ourselves in some new racing when our show continues. Stay with us. Welcome back, everybody. The NHRA is turning up the heat on its season. The Straightliners consider this weekend stop in Columbus the beginning of the summer stretch, even uh, if the calendar doesn't agree. Eliminations in the Buckeye State were Sunday afternoon. And here's how is this for luck. Funny car top gun John Force smokes the tires, but so does Dean Scusa in the semifinals. And the Castro driver gets the ugly ooh, win. But uh, he, along with everyone else, will have to wait until tomorrow again because of, guess what, rain. They are uh, down to the finals, and uh, Force will go after, we think, win number five instead of six against uh, Hoffman, the Western Auto driver. Has one title this year and has lane choice. Now, in pro stock, WJ has a chance at a second straight win. He'll have lane choice against Steve Schmidt, who's winless in 95. And in top fuel, it's another top qualifier Scotty Coletta against Eddie the Thrill Hill, the reigning series champ, has lane choice, and we'll show you how everybody comes out of it on Final Edition next week. Now, you won't find any more popular couple in drag racing than Eddie and Ursie Hill. Randy Anthony spent a few moments with the couple that seem made for each other. When you think of racing teams, whether Winston Cup, late model stock, or NHRA, you probably think about good old boys, grown men playing with their grown-up toys. But when you see Eddie Hill and the Pennzoil NHRA team, you'll also see his wife and partner of 10 years. Has it always been that way? Absolutely. Uh, right from the get-go, it was together. This car uh, and the trailer and everything says Eddie and Ursie Hill, you know, and that's the way it's been. We had one day, and he said, here's a wrench, let's go. <laughs> it's almost like the song, You and Me and a Dog Named Boo, traveling and living off the land. Well, this is Miss Hot Dog Hill. She's four and a half years old, and she's made the entire circuit with us now four times. She's the team mascot and the official Pennzoil Pace Pup. Besides the bright yellow colors of the team, you can't miss Eddie's distinctive hair and beard or Ursie's contagious smile. And for these two, it was love of racing at first sight. I met him when he was boat racing. I was really attracted to boat racing and car racing as well. And um, so it was just kind of, and I really had a crush on him for a long time before we ever had our first date. So it's just kind of a, a mutual attraction. He loved me for my brains, and I love him for his car. <laughs> But things weren't always as good with the big name sponsor on board or enough money to buy parts or other essentials. So Eddie and Ursi had to do it themselves. Well, a lot of people don't even know this, but uh, it's impossible for a guy and his wife to run a top fuel car on their own. But we did that for about a year, and uh, it was not a pretty sight. You know, there were a lot of long hours.
cars and uh, a lot of burgers along the way, a lot of sleepless nights driving uh, our little used uh, dually that we used to pull a trailer, a little bitty trailer and all with no spares and all. We went around to several races. We didn't even have one spare piston. We've got more spare engines now than we used to have spare pistons in a crew of seven, but it used to just be two of us and uh, there was an awful lot of dues that we paid. A lot of people don't know that, but it was uh, there were some long, hard hours there, right? <laughs> yeah, there were, and for most of the uh, the first few races that we went to, we didn't qualify. We didn't have enough money even for a hotel room. There was one time at Indianapolis where we didn't have enough money to get home. We didn't qualify, and uh, we won what they call the ET pool, where all the racers, you know, put ten dollars in a pot, and whoever comes out closest to the ET that's run on the best ET that's run on the track wins the pot. We won the pot, and that's what we got home on. Marriage is supposed to be a partnership, and it's obvious that these two have a great partnership and a wonderful outlook on life. There have been a lot of tears, you know, and a lot of laughs, but it's been together, and uh, we help each other through the rough times, and then we really enjoy the good times, and last couple of three years, been a lot more good times than bad times, but uh, like I say in the beginning, it was, uh, it was an awful lot of work, a lot of dues to be paid. Penzel Pace Pup. Boy, there's a promotion in the making if I ever heard it. They're great people. They really are. It is our intention on the show to bring you every kind of motorsports from demolition derbies at St. Augustine Speedway to backwards racing at 151 Speedway. Whether it's two-wheel or four-wheel, we've covered it. But now we're uh, heading off in a slightly different direction for us. Jet ski racing. Hey, it's got a motor and people try to beat each other. Jason Young gives us our first look at this form of racing. At first look, you might think this is jet ski racing. That's not exactly true. However, there are some jet skis in the field. Jet ski is a brand name, a lot like all tissue isn't Kleenex, all bleach isn't Clorox, and all personal watercrafts are not jet skis. The big names here are Kawasaki, Sea-Doo, and Yamaha. The series is the Budweiser Jet Sports Tour, sanctioned by the International Jet Sports Boating Association. The IJSBA has been around for 14 years. Public relations manager Tony Gardia says the explosive growth of this type of racing got its biggest boost five years ago when Budweiser joined as primary sponsor of the series. Ten races make up the schedule, which is a geography lesson in itself, stretching from San Diego, California to Virginia Beach, Virginia, with stops in Dallas and Chicago along the way. Here's how the competition works. Two motos are run, and the rider getting the lowest amount of points is declared the winner. For example, if a rider wins the first moto and places third in the second moto, the total would be four. In case of a tie, the rider who finishes the highest in moto two is the winner. This year's Bud Jet Sport stop number one is at the Howard Amon Park in Richland, Washington. In the pro runabout 785 class, Minoru Kanamori gets the whole shot on his Kawasaki in Moto 1 and is never headed. It's the same story in the second Moto, giving Kanamori the season opening win. In the final rundown, Chris Vachetti is second with Tom Bonacci third. Victor Sheldon is fourth with Bo DePriest rounding out the top five. In the pro women's ski class, the battle is between Tara Lejo, Lisa Wozik, and Christy Carlson. But after two motos, it's Tara Lejo taking the victory with a total of two points. That means she won both motos. Wozik is second with Carlson, Michelle Baines, and Natalie Clark completing the top five. Now the real fun stuff, this is the pro freestyle class and the name says it all. Each rider is judged on style and technique. Seven judges make up the panel on a one to 10 scale, 10 being the highest. The high and low score are thrown out, leaving a possible high of 50 points. On this day, Mark Sickerling is the winner with a 48.2. Second is Rick Roy with Lloyd Berlew third. Fourth is Kenneth Wood and fifth is Jeff Kantz. I hope you paid attention to how the IJSBA works. Over the summer, we'll be bringing you all the latest from the Bud Jet Sports Tour 95. For On Fit Road Final Edition, I'm Jason Young reporting. Sell the IMSA car, boys. Break out the wetsuits. I think I know something I'm going to try. When we come back, we'll talk about part of the race car that has got to be comfortable and safe for a driver to do well. Stay with us. Welcome back to the program, everybody. We racers take a lot of things for granted when we climb into the race car. In fact, there are a lot of things that we don't even think about unless they're not right. 
the driver's seat is often forgotten when it comes to performance and here to talk about uh, how they're built for stock cars is Brian Butler of Butler Built Seats. And if you've ever walked through the garage, you see that little tag on all those seats out there. It says Butler Built. You've done very well with your business. We've had a tremendous response being able to work with the drivers that we have over the years. We've gained a wealth of knowledge and information that we can use to, to build the product further mm -hmm. for people all over the country, all over the world. When did you start and how did you start? Uh, the very first seat I built was for Johnny Rutherford and started right at the top. Is that right? Working as a fabricator for one of the teams right. and it evolved from there. The racers, other drivers saw what we were building and they all wanted to try it. And about 10 years now we've been doing this full time. It is amazing to me, Brian, how a lot of people in the media get to go run this little media race and that race and do a little bit of this. And enough to know that if you're not comfortable sitting in that car, you, you hold on to the steering wheel. And, you know, you go into a turn, and, and if you're not really form-fitted into that seat, you're, you're, you're re actually it's causing you to, to drive uh, not as well as you can. Absolutely. The, if the seat is not fitted to the individual properly, he cannot function to his fullest potential. There, there's just no question about that We're concept. taking a look right now uh, over at your shop uh, and, and kind of explain, if you will, what's going on there. Yeah, this here, we are, are finally started to automate a few of the operations to, toward building a seat. Uh, the seats are still an extremely labor-intensive product because of the custom nature of it. Right. When, when we are building a seat for a particular driver, they do have to be built one at a time. And you, you're, you'll have a driver will actually come in, you sit him down in, in what's really kind of an open sort of a seat, and, and you measure him as he's sitting in the seat, right? Uh, we will do that, but actually over the years we've developed a procedure to actually be able to do the proper measurements, even over the phone, through the mail, we do it across the fax lines. The, the thing that interests me the most when you were out at the shop talking the other day was, was you've, you're actually studying seats and, and talking about seats where, where there are bad crashes to figure out how to constantly improve and how to figure out how to absorb that, that energy when it moves within the car. Right, that's correct. Uh, that's uh, the key element in this whole seating as regards to a race car, in, in my mind anyway. We have to be able to provide the support necessary for the driver to function the car properly, but at the same time, we need to have a proper uh, compromise between that rigidity and impact absorption when they would impact the fence or... Quickly, only a few seconds left. If I'm just a part-time racer, do I need a seat that really fits my body? Absolutely. It doesn't matter where you run. It doesn't matter what class of competition you run. The custom seat the, is going the to seat help. is going to allow you to yeah. perform better. It's great. Good, good to see you, Brian. Congratulations yeah, this is great. on a very successful business. I use the product, and I know thousands of other people that do as well. This is great. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate you being with us. Right after this, the Have a Tampa Tour cranks back up. Don't go away. And welcome back, everybody. The Have a Tampa Tour took a week off to watch many of its regulars go up to Eldor Speedway for the dream race and do very well. But Saturday, it was back to business of chasing a championship. After a two-week break, the Have a Tampa Dirt Racing Series is back in action in the Volunteer State with $10,000 on the line for whoever's leading at the end of 100 laps. Freddie Smith in the double zero is the early leader after starting on the pole. He's trying to redeem himself after failing to make the big 100,000 to win dream event at Eldora Speedway just one week before. The guy who won that race is series points leader Scott Bloomquist in the 18, who can almost always be found up front at any Habitampa race. But on this particular night in Crossville, he's having trouble getting past third, instead having to follow Smith and Bill Fry in the 66, who is running second. Fry tries his best to try and catch the leader, but can't seem to even get close. Not even a couple of minor cautions help. They do manage to slow things down, but on every restart, Smith is on rails as he dominates from flag to flag for his second win of the 1995 season. Fry holds on to second, while Bloomquist has to settle for third. Stan Massey and Ronnie Johnson complete the top five. And before we head into our last segment, we thought you'd like to hear what some of the other weekend winners and near winners had to say. 
Well, I tell you, we've struggled real hard at Eldor uh, last couple years, and I've just had trouble getting through the corners. But, the, you know, the track got right up against the fence, and and we've been having trouble getting around there. And tonight we had that thing rolling around. It was pretty easy to drive up there. And, you know, we just went real, everything went real smooth. The only, the only one problem when I got uh, Lap and Joe there, I got slid under him and clipped him just a little bit. And, you know, it, sort of an accident, but uh, we was running good, you know. We was running good around the top, and I'm just glad to feel the car handling good around here for a change. I think we were better than the 94 car, and then, and then you know, they had that, that tangle up, and then I felt like, actually, that I was catching Steve there before the, you know, before the last yellow, but uh, I sure would have liked to got up there and raced with him, but, uh, you know, after the restart, uh, after the red, he, he took off. I couldn't deal with him, and... Uh, and uh, he was a better car tonight. Uh, I wasn't going to get in Dorsey's way, so I stayed right real tight with Ronnie uh, and pushed him pretty hard all the way. So I, you know, we were just racing real hard, and uh, Dorsey was a real gentleman, and, and it's just real fun to be back here. The team's worked so hard, and I'm just tickled to death. Me and Shane raced there for a long time, and then um, Willard 01 car, man, he was really hooked up on the bottom. I couldn't, I couldn't get on the bottom. I ran up there and lose stuff all night. That's on where, where my, you know, the only place my car run. But um, they're downtown Radio, Port City, Carrera Shops. I mean, they, they've been doing a job for me all year with just the third, second out of five races. And shoot, I'm ready to win one of these things, man. Second place is nice, you know, three of them. You know, we're probably back in the points lead and stuff. But shoot, man, I'm ready to win a race. Second ain't bad. We're not done yet. In just a moment, we'll uh, take a look at last weekend's Baja 500. Stay with us. On Pit Road Final Edition is brought to you by your GM Goodwrench service dealer. We want your business. And by AC Delco. It's like buying time. Welcome back, everybody. Last weekend's Ducati Baja 500 was the second longest race of the season, and Jerry Garrett tells us what happened. The Baja 500 last weekend had a surprising and tragic outcome. The Ford BF Goodrich Rough Rider team had a particularly heart-rending day. This is early leader John Swift, who later rolled his Ford Ranger. He suffered a broken arm and wrist, and his co-driver, Dino Pagata, was critically injured. Dave Simon and his co-driver were also injured later, though not as seriously, when their Ford F-150 tumbled over. And teammate Steve Oligas suffered three cracked vertebrae and a hard landing. The only team member to even finish was Rob McCacker, who came in 11. None of the factory teams in this race fared very well. In fact, Ivan Stewart's BFG Toyota in third was the highest factory finisher. The best showing, therefore, was by the independents. All three of the Baldwin team entries finished in the top six. But the big surprise was the winner, Kurt LeDuc. He campaigns a supposedly obsolete Jeep Cherokee. Except for his own hard work and a little financial help from Valvoline and the Donovy Jeep Eagle dealership in Southern California, LeDuc is mostly on his own. But he's had a great time in the last three Baja races, second in last year's Baja 1000, second again in the San Felipe 250 a few months back, and now he's well-placed in the points for the Trophy Truck Season Championship, which is worth a cool quarter of a million dollars to the winner. Reporting from Baja, California, this is Jerry Garrett. Thanks, Jerry. And finally, last weekend's ACT event is the uh, final race for tonight's show, and we didn't want you Northeast fans to think we had forgotten one of your favorite series. Anytime Oxford Plains is on the schedule before July, drivers consider it a tune-up for the big Oxford 250. This time out, Stan Meserve has the pole and for a third of the race keeps his number two mount ahead of the pack. But Dave Whitlock in a brand new car works around Meserve on lap 54 for the first lead change. On a restart a few laps later, Tracy Gordon in the 17 out drags Whitlock into turn one and everyone is pulling for him. His daughter had died the past week after a heart transplant. But if Gordon, who started started 17th is to win, he'll have to earn it, and Whitlock's back in front within eight laps on the four-tenths mile speedway. A final caution sets up a three-lap dash, and the leaders trade a little paint, but Gordon's got himself in the wrong spot at the wrong time, and he sees a possible win go away. Whitlock is never headed from there for his first win of the year. Ralph Nason's second place helps him extend the points lead. Gordon fell to fourth in the final standings. In the points, Leighton is second with Rowe, Rondu, and Demers within a few points of each other when the tour resumes action in Plattsburgh, New York next Saturday night.
And finally, our crewman of the uh, week goes to the guy who found the breaker box and got the lights back up in here. Wow, 10 years, that's the first time that's ever happened. Boy, and we'll uh, have the light shining next week for you. That'll do it for this week. I'm Pat Patterson. Thanks for joining us. My buddy, Mark Allen, is here next Sunday. Until then, keep your light shining. We'll see you then.